always has had an interest in realism and and you know drawing the human body in a form has, has for me and for a lot of people is probably the greatest challenge I think to, to get it right technically and I, I think one of the biggest influences that, that really pushed me into portraiture was when I was taking my undergraduate at the U of M and I saw the, the Chuck Close portrait of himself with a little cigarette dangling out of his mouth and I couldn't understand. I, I was not aware of his work. You know, I, I was very blind to a lot of the contemporary art that was, was going on at that time. And I could not understand how somebody could have, have created that portrait. I did a lot of research um, after the trip. And when I found out the process, it, was, it seemed like such a daunting task to, to create an image like that. But at the same time, I, I felt like it was a challenge to maybe push myself in that direction, to, to find a process that could help me achieve that level of realism in, in a portrait. When I think back, it, there really was like almost no decision. Um, it, it's just something I was doing. I can't even remember like wanting to start or, or what the reasons were for, for doing it. I, I, I just know that I, w I was always drawing. Um, I think a lot of it had to do, obviously, from my dad, the uh, influence of him being an architect, and he always had uh, nice drawing pencils, because everything back then was manual drafting, it was, there was no computers, so a lot of paper, a lot of nice uh, drawing pads, and, and um, I think that's really where it just was like a natural step for me to, to start doing that as a kid. I definitely was interested in precision back then, you know, I mean, that, that was something I was, like, if I think about it, that was probably the main focus behind it was like getting things right. I do remember using grid paper at one point just to sort of help locate, you know, shapes and form and, and space just to sort of get things right. So there was that element of, of draftsmanship that I was really concerned about copying. My dad had, you know, there's different steps, different different drawings that he would have to, some would be pencils and then he'd have to go with the jewel tip markers or I think they were called the, the drafting pens and get the lines perfectly straight, different widths. So I'm sure that that lent itself to my desire to sort of get things precise because those, those instruments, it's almost like cross-hatching or, or just a nice outline is what those pens encouraged. The, the portraits where you can see flesh and hair, and it's, it's somebody with their eyes closed or they're, they're turned away, like looking into, the, into the, the painting and you're looking at their back of their head. I mean that, that for me is very much you know, about an urban experience. Again, like this density of the crowd um, in, a, in a large, you know, large busy city setting, a street corner or a subway car or an elevator where you're just really close up to a stranger, closer than you and I would be or, or you know, just two friends hanging out. You would never invade somebody's personal space like that. But in these large urban settings, that happens always, you mean, whenever you're in a busy place and, and you, you don't have a problem with it, you just accept those conditions because you have to, because everybody's just trying to get from point A to point B and there's times where we're going to be that close where you can, you know, if you're standing in, in a subway car and, and somebody's like six inches away from you, you can see the back of their head, you can see the, you know, the dandruff on their, their collar of their jacket or you can just see the little imperfections in their skin or their stubble, maybe a place where they missed, you know, shaving a little bit and there's a couple of strands, like long strands of hair. And those portraits really, for me, are about that experience with, with another human being, but again, completely, like, with no, no personal interaction, just, just like a surface that you can explore. Museum of Art was was a huge influence. I mean, I, I, I tried to go there um, almost every Sunday for a while because it was a short little walk from my university housing through the park to the Met. And, um, you know, I'd try to go every Sunday morning, take a little bit of time off from the studio um, and just, just go look at paintings.
There were some Spanish paintings I would spend a lot of time looking at, American painters like a Sargent. I also went to the Frick quite a bit because I felt like you could go there and really look at almost every painting in that collection because it's smaller and not quite as busy and you can have a little bit more of an intimate experience. I would sometimes go there and I'd have like a, a technical mission, like something I'd want to look at, maybe a specific painting or, or some technique, you know, or, or try to figure out how, how somebody had handled the creases in a material or a shadow on somebody's flesh. But also it was just the excitement of knowing that, you know, this is, I'm in New York and, and here is a chance to go look at these paintings right in person. And I, I felt like I wanted to make sure I, I just had no regrets about not going out there enough. So I just made sure that it was part of my schedule. And, and you know, it, it really became research, development, relaxation, um, enjoyment, and you know, all, all of those, those elements, I think, existed in, in almost every visit that I, when I would go to these places. It's almost like I could go there and relax from the New York, the pace of, of the New York City, like, like craziness, and recharge my batteries at the same time I wander around and, and maybe not even think about the paintings but but the, the spaces were so quiet and intimate I could relax and then I could also just tune back into the paintings and, and enjoy them and then I could leave and I, I would feel like I had some kind of a, a like a moment of rest or or just a, some personal space from the craziness and I'd go back to my studio and, and just feel invigorated to start painting again. You know, when I turned 13, 14, I started uh, becoming interested in skateboarding. I really enjoyed it because it's, it's a really, it's an individual sport. Um, and it, it's much like um, having a studio practice now, the way I paint or, or draw, like I can do it by myself. Uh, skateboarding is the same way. You can go out and you can go find a curb down the street or you go to a parking lot or downtown, wherever there's, some, there's interesting terrain to, to skateboard on, you can do it yourself. I think the last couple of years when I was skateboarding, there was such an emphasis on um, the graphics on, on the bottom of the pro's skateboard. Everybody had their own style, you know, and that was something that we became, people became, all my friends became very particular about that. Also, the graphic tees, t-shirts were becoming um, very important. We were all very specific about our clothing. Everybody sort of had a certain style or certain graphics that they liked. And I think that's something that we all started to consider, just the, the visual element of, of the skateboarding, whether it's you would call it the uniform or like the, the boards, but that was something that was important to all of us. And you know, a lot of my friends who not only were extremely talented skateboarders were also just, I think, visually and, and artistically really talented. And so that became something that was important in our discussions too when we were hanging out. It wasn't just about skateboarding the pros, but there was a lot of talk about the um, the graphic side of that sport. It, it, it's very hard <laughs> to make a living as a skateboarder and it was very painful. You know, the, the tricks we were doing at that point were, were risky and you could really hurt yourself and you have to be competitive. So if somebody else is doing something sophisticated, you gotta sort of push yourself to go that route. And it just became um, 
you know, I, I guess I was a little bit bored of it too. And that was when I started to, to get back into drawing and painting. And I, you know, within about half a year, I'd say around 20, when I turned 20, I really, really started to focus on drawing again and spent a lot of time doing that. And it really took over um, my life again and, and skateboarding just sort of fell to the, to the wayside. or really dark lines and creases. And I usually try to paint um, information that's farthest away in the painting, and then meaning surface areas that are, are farthest away, and then I, I try to f you know, finish with the, the surface areas that are on top. I just find it, it, it just, I can control light and, and form better that way. It's already starting to build up a little with some ripples and imperfections there from uh, just glazing in those the darker areas. It, it somehow it makes the surface less sticky so I can do another couple of layers. I'm interested in, you know, like a, a very detailed realism, but it's very subjective. I, I think if you look at the paintings up close, you can see there's there's imperfections, there's mistakes, they're not perfect. You can see, even though the paintings may look like they're very tightly rendered when you get close to them, you can see there's brushwork in there. And, you know, to, to, to define the my, my painting style, like it's a very detailed, subjective realism. I mean, that's the way I would look at it, but it's... I don't think it has like a, a polished photographic uh, surface, which is literally in dialogue with a photograph. I think it, it, I think it becomes a painting by itself when you look at it. I prefer to paint on wood because there's no bounce. Uh, I found that with canvas, um, especially with the way I like to glaze, uh, the canvas could move around too much and it was hard to, to put down the layers with, with accuracy. And so the, the, the hard surface just allows me to really spread the paint around on thin glazes and it just, I feel like I have better control of the paint that way. I also feel that my work has got a lot of historical references to Renaissance portraiture and wood panels as a traditional substrate. It's, so it's a bit of, a bit of a, an homage to the past but also uh, a way to, to let my technique um, sort of feel more comfortable as I'm painting. I'm a little anxious just to see how, how it's going to feel when it's done. I think it's going to be a strong painting and I, I think it's going to be, mo most importantly for me, it's going to be really a, a sincere move. This is the first painting where I've really removed, you know, pretty much all reference to the figure, except that the, the fabric is, is still fabric worn by people, but because it's floating and there's no reference to, to the figure inside of it, it's uh, for me. It's it's the the biggest move into abstraction that, that I've taken at this point. Now, you know, for the for me, the figure is maybe not that important at all, and it's really about making the image of, of the the painting reflect more of, of the the process of the painting, where I'm I'm spending time again thinking about those those primary for me primary um, ideas of, of the painting: color, form, structure, shape. So I thought I would just find a way to, to remove the figure completely. 
I keep telling myself the painting is, um, it's very organic. It's, it's got so many little imperfections in it that there's no way the painting's gonna be perfect. There's always gonna be little areas that are, are sort of, don't have the, the exact same language as, as the entire painting does. So it's, it's a matter of just sort of settling with that and you know, loving the painting for the way it is and, and just sending it out to the world. Most of the paintings, when they go out, I feel like there's always a few elements of it that just are not perfect, but it's, it's, um, I'm not a machine. I'm okay with, with imperfections now.